Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, thoroughly a devotee of the muse Clio, an American historian of sorts, both by professional training and preference. Yet I don't believe I've ever before encountered a lesson about our past told as tautly or as well as when in the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, my guest today wrote in the New York Times, Adrift in a sea of troubles, the United States seems in danger of coming unmoored from its own historical identity. Well, David M. Kennedy is the distinguished professor of American history at Stanford University, whose wonderfully evocative Oxford University Press book, Freedom from Fear, the American People in Depression and War, 1929 to 1945, won the Pulitzer Prize for History. And I hope he won't feel today that I stretched the doctrine of fair use too far in quoting at length from his Times piece, assuring us that as its heading reads, it's been dark before. For at least some Americans, Professor Kennedy writes, can still remember the teeming anxieties that plagued the United States after the assault on Pearl Harbor. Popular culture recollects a people resolute and energized in the wake of the Japanese surprise attack. But in fact, the mood of America in the weeks after December 7, 1941, was baffled, frightened, and grim. The Nazis had already conquered most of Western Europe. They seemed all but certain to bring the Soviet Union to its knees within weeks, even days. The sober reality was that Churchill faced the galling prospect of acquiescence in German mastery over Europe and Japanese hegemony in Asia, as most of the senior American military command gloomily and not unreasonably predicted. Hitler's blitzkrieg tactics had caught the world flat-footed. The Wehrmacht's mechanized attack had forced a supposedly formidable France to capitulate within a few inglorious weeks. The warlords in Tokyo appeared ready to make good on their promise to turn the Pacific into a Japanese lake. Small wonder that panic seized the West Coast in late 1941, an expectation of imminent Japanese bombardment and even invasion. Radio stations went off the air, lest their signals serve as navigational beacons to enemy aircraft. Jumpy officials moved the Rose Bowl game out of harm's way from Pasadena to North Carolina. Supposedly disloyal Japanese Americans were accused of hatching diabolical plots to poison water supplies and blow up electrical generating plants. A prominent newspaper columnist demanded the incarceration of the entire Japanese American community in California and to hell with habeas corpus, a dark wish that soon came true. Apprehension gripped the eastern seaboard as well as German U-boats in early 1942 began the wholesale sinking of American ships off the Atlantic coast before the eyes of horrified spectators on shore. Submarine predation <coughs> in subsequent months nearly choked off the convoys of food and war material to Britain. Teams of German saboteurs came ashore in Florida and New York. 
Professor Kennedy sums up, a bleaker, more hopeless picture is difficult to imagine. Yet we know how that story ended. And yes, it's true that we know how the story ended. But I must ask my guest today whether it mustn't be a great caution that so few Americans do know how it began and that indeed it's been dark before. We don't know that much about our history, do we? Well, we, we'll never know as much about our history as professional historians or aficionados like you and I might wish. Uh, but I think this is one lesson that has been surely swamped in the general congratulatory uh, mood of uh, popular culture in this country about World War II, that we have been somewhat uh, ignorant of or unwilling to recognize just how absolutely flat-footedly unprepared this country was for the scale and uh, kind of conflict that it was sucked into so dramatically on December 7th, 1941. Did the reaction to this Times piece uh, indicate that? Well, many people who read the piece of that generation uh, wrote me or got in touch with me and thanked me for the reminder. Uh, others, uh, presumably somewhat younger without that memory, uh, expressed surprise. Some even expressed a little bit of outrage that, uh, that they were to, to be reminded of, that the country could be in such a state of unpreparedness at such a critical moment. You know, the, the um, well, perhaps lack of historical knowledge uh, amused me in the illustration that here, and I didn't read it, that uh, section of your piece, Hitler's Blitzkrieg tactics had caught the world flat-footed. Uh, the uh, Times had taken upon itself a parenthetical statement to explain what Blitzkrieg meant. Well, actually, that wasn't the Times. That was uh, the original did author. Did you do that? Yes, because I, I, I had, did not have a sufficient confidence that everybody would understand the German term, which, of course, means lightning war. Uh, and it was the, the name given by uh, journalists, actually, to this tactic of very fast-moving, heavily mechanized warfare that the Germans, uh, at which the Germans were such great innovators in World War II. But that, that tactic, the tactic of Blitzkrieg in 1940, 40, 39, 40, 41, when the Germans first launched it, was uh, seen as some kind of revolution in the art of warfare. And even Winston Churchill, such a keen student of military doctrine and history as he, uh, says out, right out in his memoirs that he was flummoxed and flabbergasted at the uh, military consequence of a fast-moving body of armor. He had never anticipated this. The Germans used a mix of armor and infantry in all new ways. So it, it caught my attention as I tried to think through some uh, elements of comparison between World War II and our present situation that just as the tactic of commercial hija hijacking of commercial airliners and using them as uh, weapons, uh, the, the events of September 11th, of course, was an innovation of kinds of a kind, so too was Blitzkrieg. Uh, so too in the Pacific Theater in World War II uh, was the uh, Japanese development way before we really uh, got onto it of uh, the, uh, the, the new technology of the aircraft carrier. So in 1941-42, we were confronted, you might say, on, in both theaters, both the European and the Pacific theaters, with absolutely revolutionary uh, doctrines of war fighting for which we were rather woefully unprepared. But it's not then only the generals who are preparing to fight the last war, all of us. Well, yes, actually there's some room for argument about that, I think. That is the old maxim that generals always prepare to fight the last war. Uh, the great exception to that in the case of World War II, I think, and here I think American military and political leaders get some credit for it, uh, is the development of air power. That the, uh, as early as the 1920s, or certainly by the early 1930s, there are senior officers in the United States Army in particular, uh, Billy Mitchell would be the prime example, who are, are trying to find ways to fight the next battle, whatever it might be. They don't, they don't, they don't foresee World War II in, in precise terms. But they're trying to find ways to avoid the bloodletting of trench warfare that had been so costly of human life in World War I. And the, the device they hit on is this new technology of the airplane. And the United States and Britain are the two countries that invest heavily in developing uh, again, a new doctrine of warfare, which is uh, the long-range, deep-penetration strategic bomber, the B-17 and the B-24, and eventually the successor aircraft that ends World War II by dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that is the B-29. So in some sense, uh, at some level at least, within uh, amongst American planners, there was a recognition that the next war, uh, 
which they couldn't see in detail to repeat, but the next war would have to be fought by different means, and aircraft, the aircraft was the new technology they utilized. Can you extrapolate from that, from that experience, the Billy Mitchell experience, what our military leaders understand about the next war now? Well, I think we can only extrapolate with difficulty. Uh, as I'm fond of saying, even the most uh, assiduous students of the past can't see very far into the future. I think that's just a limitation, a uh, human limitation that we have to face. Um, but it's striking to a degree th that the, the, the pr in the present crisis, the crisis since September 11th, uh, the response that we've made has looked like conventional warfare, uh, even though we're told daily and uh, by our leadership and we remind ourselves that this is a highly unconventional situation, can't be fought by traditional means, and so on. Now, the bulk of what we've seen to date looks like conventional war. Aircraft attacks on Afghanistan, the introduction of ground troops after softening from the air, uh, uniform forces in the field. There may be other things going on, but what we've mainly seen to this point looks like quite conventional war. So up, up to this point, at least, it does look as if uh, in, in the terms of our response so far, we are fighting the last war in a sense. We're fighting by what we've come to call conventional means. You talked about Billy Mitchell, talking about the, the uh, rising interest in air power in the 20s, turning to the 30s and uh, just before the war. How do you evaluate Franklin Roosevelt's understanding of what we were going to need and then what he did about it in terms of military power. Well, I, I give credit to, credit to Roosevelt on a lot of fronts, actually, with many different dimensions, for being quite a visionary leader. Uh, I, I don't buy the traditional conventional wisdom that he was a uh, opportunistic uh, pragmatist who simply grabbed for whatever solution was at hand. I think he had a a very keen sense of where history had deposited him and his country by the 1930s and what needed to be done uh, to make this country secure and safe against uh, the threat of future economic crisis and uh, threat from abroad. On the particular dimension of war fighting doctrine, uh, Roosevelt in fact was a great patron of air power and he endorsed the decision that was made by the American military in the early 1930s, actually even before he was president, but he endorsed it when he became president, to let out a design competition for a deep penetration strategic bomber, the competition that was eventually won by the Boeing Aircraft Company and the B-17 bomber. The first prototypes of the B-17 actually flew as early as 1935. And Roosevelt, from the beginning, consistently supported the development of a large strategic air arm. So the origins of the, the war fighting doctrine that remains to this day, uh, this country's regnant uh, doctrine, the, preferred, the way we prefer to fight a war if possible, that is from the air, with what today we call standoff weapons, weapons that can be fired from a great distance to great effect, uh, weapons that are sparing of American lives but nevertheless deliver a powerful blow against the enemy. That doctrine really was hatched after World War I. There are a number of theorists of air power, not all in this country, incidentally. It was embraced by the American military in the early 1930s, if not sooner. Franklin Roosevelt gave his powerful support to it. Uh, it's why the, the, the principal means that this country uh, used to fight World War II was air power. Uh, we fight from the air in Europe beginning in August of 1942. August 17, 1942 is the date of the first B-17 attack on Nazi-occupied Europe. It's an attack on uh, Rouen, in Fran on Nazi-occupied France. D-Day comes almost two years later, uh, the great battle that we think marks uh, our major intervention in the war. But in fact, for most of the duration of the war in Europe, uh, the principal means by which we carried the battle to our German adversary was uh, not on the ground front, but uh, from the air front. Do you think that was an effective uh, front for us? Well, there was great controversy at the time. There was, you might say, inter-service uh, debate uh, b between the proponents of air power and traditional uh, exponents of ground warfare as to which of these, uh, what mix of these two uh, ways of uh, battle might be more effective. And because of the irresolution of that debate, um, this country created a, an outfit called the United States Strategic Bombing Survey which was, uh, consisted of teams of experts, economists, psychologists, sociologists, and so on. Uh, industrial specialists who followed the advancing American troops across the Rhine right into Germany uh, 
in uh, late 44, early 45, and tried to assess as swiftly and effectively as they could just what was the contribution of air power uh, to the ultimate victory. And the final assessment? The, the final assessment in Europe was quite ambiguous. They, they could not come to a firm conclusion. Uh, about Which was a surprise, wasn't it? Well, it was a great surprise to the theorists of air power who were, had a vested interest in proving that strategic aerial warfare was not simply another weapon, but was the war-winning weapon. It was, a, it was a revolutionary system of war fighting that could change the nature of warfare itself. Wouldn't you say not just to the theorists, but to the uh, Americans who sat back and watched? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, but when, when the question went unresolved in the European theater, even after the investigations and findings of the bombing survey, then the great site, the, the venue, the, the, the locus of debate shifted to the uh, Pacific theater and to Japan. Uh, and that's in, in the longer run, you might say, uh, m much of the significance of the atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 that brought the, uh, the war to final conclusion in Asia as well as in Europe. Uh, part of the significance of that was that this became a trump card in the hands of the proponents of air power, that they were able to prove on the Japanese case that air power, and essentially air power alone in the last uh, days and weeks of the war, had brought Japan to its knees. Uh, not, not, uh, of course, they had the added bonus, you might say, of not, it wasn't air power pure and simple, it was air power with uh, the introduction of this awesome new weapon, uh, the atomic bomb. Well, you described so well the, the uh, notification to Harry Truman uh, sitting with the other world leaders that it had worked. Uh, what about FDR? Had he at all been uh, aware of the closeness of the development of the bomb, of an effective working bomb? Well, the, the, the bomb's uh, effectiveness or, or the, the, the fact that we would have a workable weapon was not known, of course, until July of 1945. After he had died. After Roosevelt is dead. But there was reason, he had reason to be optimistic about the success of the so-called uh, Manhattan Project. Uh, he knew it was progressing more or less on schedule. So there was reason to be hopeful that this country would have this weapon in hand in time to be useful in the current war. I might say parenthetically, that there is n absolutely no reason to presume that he would not have used the weapon against Germany had it been developed in time. Well, uh, of course, that's the question I wanted to ask you. Was there any sense of the dimension of the damage that would be done in any compunction? Much, much of the military and scientific discussion of the bomb as it's being developed, uh, curiously enough, in retrospect, it's curious, focused largely on the blast effect of the bomb and only kind of incidentally on the radiation effect. There, as I read the record at least, there did not seem to be a primary uh, focus on the, uh, the radiation damage that, the, that this kind of weapon uh, would inflict. We're now very, very uh, aware of that sort of thing as we were made to be after investi the investigation on the ground of the consequences of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But Roosevelt certainly understood that this was a, uh, a, a, a qualitatively different kind of weapon, that it held the promise of changing the nature of warfare and indeed of changing the nature of relationships amongst nations across the board. Precisely what diplomatic and political use he intended to make of the bomb is not at all clear. Uh, the record simply doesn't speak to us with the kind of clarity we would wish about he, he knew it was a trump card and he repeatedly said to his very small circle of intimate advisors who knew about the bomb, notably Henry Stimson, that at some point he wanted to bring, put this card on the table, particularly in his relationship with the Soviet Union. But precisely how he was going to play that hand, we don't know. Let me go back a bit to something you said about Roosevelt the theorist and uh, the praise you have for his um, insight and farsightedness in his um, thinking about military matters. You dismissed the idea as if it were a uh, negative, as if it were pejorative, that he was a pragmatist, essentially. I'm interested in why, why you do that. Well, I, d <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's necessarily a, a negative to be a pragmatist. I, I use the term in the sense that it's often used colloquially about him, that he had no syst systematic ideas, that he had no deep social or political philosophy. Uh, I don't believe that's true. Uh, particularly in the dimension of uh, domestic uh, social and economic reform. I, I believe it's clear from the record of Roosevelt's correspondence and speeches dating from the 1920s uh, 
that he understood that the, the great cumulative forces of history uh, had brought this country as it had engaged with this great historical development we know as the Industrial Revolution uh, to a point where the, the free and, and unfettered workings of laissez-faire free market capitalism simply had to be tamed and contained uh, in ways to contain their volatilities, to prevent uh, excessive damage to human beings who were swept up in it. This was his agenda and his program from the time he sought the presidency in 1932. And though to be sure there's a lot of apparent uh, contradictory uh, moves in the early New Deal era, uh, the overall objective of uh, making this country safer economically and socially, protecting individuals from the volatilities of a completely unregulated free market system. That central goal, I think, was clearly in focus from the beginning. How then do we uh, find that there are so many people who uh, dismiss him? Uh, they quote Walter Lippmann and then they go on to uh, his whispering in this ear and in that ear and uh, being ultimately what you, the word you used before was the opportunist. Yes, well, you, you reference Walter Lippmann, who called Roosevelt a kind of amiable boy scout in a famous column during the 32 presidential campaign, Lippmann said something to the effect that Franklin D. Roosevelt is a very genial man who without any particular qualifications for the office would very much like to be president. Uh, a sentence that uh, has been quoted endlessly as representing uh, Lippmann's misestimation or underestimation of him. Uh, but wh why does this picture persist in, in mm -hmm. our memory of him as a uh, uh, unsystematic opportunist? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think part of it has to do with this with the sheer quantity of things that happened that he initiated in the 1930s, uh, not all of them successfully, particularly with the kind of pell-mell frantic search for a uh, an instrument that could be used to overcome or end the Depression in 1933 in the famed 100 Days. Uh, many of the, the legislative initiatives of that period do appear to be a bit helter-skelter. Uh, so I think that, that image has persisted. It's a very strong, dramatic, and narrative image. It's easy to see how it inhabits uh, people's consciousness. But I believe, as I tried to argue in my book, if you look at the New Deal as a whole, its overall objectives are consistent, its overall achievement is clear. And your evaluation ultimately, finally? Of the New Deal? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was an extremely positive and uh, indeed necessary development in American history and in some ways it merely, the New Deal in some ways merely brought the United States as a society into alignment with the kinds of political accommodations to the Industrial Revolution that every Western industrialized society had by then largely accomplished. And how do we find so often people dismissing the accomplishments of the New Deal in terms of the economic situation in this country until the war began to change our economic situation? Well, I think the answer to that is actually simple. It's because the, the New Deal spectacularly failed to accomplish what we might say was its uh, single most urgent object objective, and that was ending the Depression. Uh, in, 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 while failing to end the Depression, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, in fact, put in place a structure of durable reforms and institutions that still shape the social and economic, political, cultural landscape that we live in today. That's, uh, suffice it to say, so the Social Security Act is the principal example, I suppose. But the, the, none of his policies until World War II came along succeeded in lifting the pall of depression from this country, the unemployment rate averaged 17 percent per year in the first eight years of the two Roosevelt, first two Roosevelt administrations. Uh, it's strictly on grounds of economic policy. That was a, a rather conspicuous failure. But that failure to solve the economic crisis of the depression, uh, I think, also underwrote or made possible uh, the political achievement of things like the Social Security Act the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Banking Act, and so on and so forth. It's interesting you list things that one could look at the more recent history of the United States and say, my goodness, those things are being challenged. Those are the very things, not in their essence, but uh, on some level are being challenged today. Well, I, I think as a, among the reasons why the New Deal, what we call in this country the New Deal, comes so late in our history when other societies had embraced measures to uh, take some of the risk and insecurity out of uh, 
free market capitalism. Among the reasons that happened so late in our history is because historically, going way back to the 18th century, if not before, uh, we've been a society that's been very suspicious of power and especially very suspicious of investing power in the central or federal government. So we do these kinds of things later than other people's. We do them, by and large, in a more attenuated and limited way. Our welfare state has historically been much smaller uh, than that which exists in the societies with which we usually compare ourselves. Again, the prime example of that would be our inability right down to the present day to provide universal uh, health care uh, coverage, whereas all the other Western societies have long since found ways to do that. So we, we remain suspicious of power. Uh, the great American historian Henry Adams uh, once said that suspicion of power in whatever form it presented itself was the taproot American political reflex. Uh, and I think there's a deep truth to that. And when you think it's a deep, there's a deep truth to that, do you applaud? Well, I, on, on, I think I, if it's possible, I clap with one hand. <laughs> the, I think there's something healthy about the suspicion of power. Uh, I do think at times we're over-suspicious or, or paranoid suspicious about power, and it prevents us from using the instrument of government to address uh, issues that uh, most other societies have found ways to use that kind of instrument uh, intelligently, and we, we have difficulty with that. You say intelligently and well, I presume you mean. Well, the history of the last two or three decades reminds us that uh, some of the, our sister societies in the North Atlantic community especially have had difficulties sustaining the kind of uh, measures of social provision uh, that I'm talking about, and some of them have backed away from that a bit. So it's a reminder perhaps that uh, some of our deep-seated cultural skepticism about these matters maybe is somewhat well-placed. Which indicates to me that there are many more questions I want to ask of you, but our time is up right now. If you'll stay where you are, we'll do another program because I do want to ask you about power again. Okay. Thanks, Professor Kennedy, Thank for you. joining me today. Thank you. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to the Open Mind P.O. Box 7977 FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.